In this video, I'm going to explain the differences between term life insurance, whole life insurance, and universal life insurance. We are going to start with a concept that underpins prices for insurance, which is directly related to explaining the differences between types of life insurance policies available. And that concept is this. Mortality rates increase exponentially. In plain English, what that means is the likelihood of you dying increases the older you are, but that rate of increase increases. Looking at the United States in 2016, the odds of a 40-year-old man dying within the next year were 0.242%, which means for 40-year-old men, 2.42 out of 1,000 would be expected to die in a given year. For 41-year-old men, that rate increases to 2.53 out of 1,000. And for 42-year-old men, it increases again to 2.663 out of 1,000. What you'll note is that the increase increases. The increase in the odds between 40 and 41-year-olds is 0.11, but the increase in odds between 41 and 42-year-olds is 0.133. So conceptually, if we were to plot the likelihood of dying in the next year on the y-axis and age on the x-axis, we would get a curve that looks something like this. If every year you were to buy a new one-year life insurance policy, you could use this same graph and replace the likelihood of dying with the insurance premium in dollars, which remember is just the fancy word for the cost of the insurance. So what this means is that if you were repeatedly buying a one-year life insurance policy, the price would go up every single year, and later in life, it would become unaffordable. And this change in cost doesn't really get dramatic until later on in life. So for example, the same amount of coverage or death benefit that costs, say, $10 per month for a 20-year-old might cost $20 per month for a 40-year-old, $100 per month for a 60-year-old, but might shoot up to $1,000 per month for an 80-year-old. Now, in reality, people don't buy one-year life insurance policies. This brings us to our first type of life insurance, term life insurance. So if we take our graph and we separate it into 10-year intervals, an insurance company might say, instead of just increasing the price every year, we'll set a static cost for the entire 10-year period, or term. And this fixed cost during the term would be a bit higher than the one-year cost earlier on in that term, but a bit lower than the one-year cost later on in that 10-year term. So essentially, they're averaging it out. And so to be clear, for this 10-year term life policy, the monthly premium would stay the same for that entire 10-year period. After that 10 years is up, there would be a higher monthly premium for the next 10-year term, and the same for the third 10-year term. It would go up. So let's look at an example policy to just spell this out. Let's say that we had a 30-year-old with a term 10 life insurance policy with a coverage amount or death benefit of $250,000. That initial premium, the cost of the policy, might be $15 per month. And so what that would mean is they would pay $15 every month for the next 10 years for the same $250,000 death benefit should he die. In year 11, which would be the beginning of the second 10-year term, the premiums would increase to maybe $100 per month if they kept their policy. They would still have the $250,000 coverage amount. And in the third 10-year term, the premiums might again jump up again to something like, I don't know, $300 per month. Another option that is available, for example, is a 20-year term life insurance policy. And in this case, all that means is that the monthly premium would remain the same for a 20-year period, and the amount of the premium might look something like this for the first term. And it might look something like this for the second 20-year term. And as you can see, the costs start out really low, but soon escalates to the point of being very, very expensive. So it's relatively cheap to get lots of insurance coverage when you're young and healthy but very expensive when you are older. For many people, you know, this might be all the type of insurance that they ever need or want. Over time, as your assets grow, your need for protection decreases. And term life insurance is synonymous with temporary life insurance. 
And this is quite a different beast compared to what's known as permanent life insurance, which I'm going to explain now. Most insurance companies don't even offer term life insurance if you're 80 years old. It's just insanely expensive. But there are some reasons why some people may still want some coverage at that age. And some of those reasons include paying for funerals, covering off a tax liability on real estate or a business that is deemed to have been disposed at death, uh, creating an inheritance or what have you. Some people use life insurance in specific financial planning strategies for more than just the death benefit. There are what are called living benefits that may be of interest as well. We'll tackle that in a separate video though. A few caveats before we start breaking down permanent insurance. As the name implies, the permanence of these policies means you really need to research them. They can be complex, involve long-term trade-offs, and many people make a lot of money selling you permanent insurance versus temporary insurance. So you have to be mindful of sales incentives when they exist. That being said, let's explain how they work. And in future videos, we'll get into more of the, you know, which policies make sense for whom. But I'm sure that over time in the comment section, it'll become quite interesting. It's a very polarizing uh, issue. So let's start by explaining permanent insurance by explaining what is called whole life insurance. Let's again take a look at a 30 year old who wants $250,000 in coverage as an example. If they wanted a 20 year term life policy, the initial monthly premium might be 20 bucks. For a whole life policy, the monthly premium might be closer to 200 bucks. So why the massive difference? Well, if we go back to our graph, you can think of a whole life policy as like a term life policy, except instead of a series of 10 year or 20 year terms, there's only one term, which is your whole life. And so if we created a level premium over the course of your entire life, we would maybe get a premium that looks something like this. And again, the concept is that you overpay early on in exchange for underpaying later on. But the early overpayment is much more pronounced. But here is another major key to understanding life insurance. Ask yourself this question. What exactly happens with those overpayments? Essentially, the insurance company invests the difference, the difference between the premiums you pay and the cost to provide the pure insurance is set aside into what is referred to as either reserves or cash value. And this excess is invested and grows over time. Let's switch to another graph to show this more specifically. Let's say that we have a whole life insurance policy and the death benefit is $100,000. The person gets this policy when say they're 30 years old. This horizontal line represents their death benefit. If they die and their policy is in force, their beneficiaries get the $100,000 as promised. But the cash value or the reserves build up over time. The difference between the death benefit and the reserves is the amount that the insurance company has at risk. They have this cash. And so they would have to pay out the difference in order to give you your $100,000 death benefit. So if someone had this policy until they're like 100, the insurance company may not actually have any risk at that point as the reserves may be equal to the death benefit. Now here's another major point to consider. Over very long periods of time, even very small changes in some assumptions can lead to a wide range of outcomes. If you use a very conservative estimate for the rate of return on these reserves, you're projecting that they aren't going to grow very fast. And so that means you would potentially charge a higher premium because as the insurance company, you would need to put more money into the reserves. And if the returns actually earned are higher than your prediction, the insurance company is gonna end up rich. There are other factors as well that go into these formulas like mortality rates and expected claims, operating expenses of the insurance company, policy lapse rates, and so on. So for example, if fewer people die than predicted, if operating expenses go down over time, and if more people let their policies lapse because of non-payment, 
then all of these things increase the profitability of the insurance company. So this is the perfect point to talk about the difference between what is called non-participating whole life insurance versus participating whole life insurance. The whole life policy we've described so far is a non-participating whole life policy. And don't worry, that name is gonna become crystal clear in about a minute. But basically in that non-participating policy, everything is guaranteed. How much your premium is, what your death benefit is gonna be, and even how much your cash values will be over time. All of that is guaranteed on your policy illustration, as it's called when you're sold a policy, they give you an illustration, and it'll show all those things, those are all guaranteed. So again, if the insurance company's assumptions are conservative, it basically means you'll end up paying more than you had to and the insurance company makes out like a bandit. But a participating whole life policy is a little different. It gets its name because you participate in the profits of the insurance company with respect to these reserves. So let's say that in year one, fewer people die and make claims than expected and the reserve fund grows faster than expected due to investment performance, the insurance company will pay out part of these profits to you every year in what's called either a dividend or a bonus, depending on what country you live in. Now, I'll get into the details of what you can do with these dividends in another video, but for now, you'll generally have the option of taking it in cash, using it to reduce the premiums that you pay, using it to purchase additional insurance, or you can put it into an interest earning account with the insurer. Again, we'll cover that in more detail in different uh, future videos. All other things being equal, the initial premiums for a participating policy are gonna be higher than a non-participating policy. But over long periods of time, the participating whole life policy may or may not work out to be less expensive. Again, it mostly depends on how far off the assumptions were versus what actually happens. But insurance companies tend to be pretty conservative in some of these estimates. So just to recap right now, we've talked about term life insurance, which is considered temporary insurance. It tends to be very cheap when you're young. Then we started talking about permanent insurance with two different types of whole life insurance policies, non-participating and participating whole life, sometimes called par whole life and non-par whole life. If it's participating whole life insurance or par whole life, we participate in the profits of the insurance company. If it's non-participating, we don't participate in the profits of the insurance company, but the initial premiums or costs will be a little bit lower. These whole life policies are going to initially look way more expensive than term, but they're designed to be around forever, permanent. They take part of your premiums early on and invest them into these pools called reserves or cash values. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. Okay, now let's again go back in time. This time, not so far. We're gonna go back to the 1970s. Back then, interest rates were high and were climbing higher. And at the very peak in the early 1980s, close to around 20%. Unemployment was also very high with lots of people losing their jobs. And this created a perfect storm of events that led to a lot of change in insurance industries around the world. On one hand, uh, with whole life policies, the insurance companies were making money hand over fist because the rates of return they used to calculate these premiums were much lower than the rates of return that they were actually getting on these reserves. And with lots of people losing their jobs, but having these high premium whole life policies, they were looking for ways to reduce their expenses, but also keep their coverage for their families. So the timing was right for a movement to be born. And so the idea of buy term and invest the rest became wildly popular. And what this refers to is the strategy of buying a term life insurance policy, which we've seen is much cheaper than whole life for the same death benefit amount, especially when you're young, and taking the difference between these two premiums and investing it yourself, right? So buy term, invest the rest. So you're getting the insurance coverage while building up your own reserve over time. At some point, you would no longer need the term life insurance because you would be effectively self-insured with your own reserves in a separate investment account to fall back on. So to counteract this, insurance companies started to heavily push a different type of permanent insurance, which allowed you to choose how the cash value of your policy was invested. 
So you could expose it to stock markets, investment funds, and, and what have you. The trade-off being is that while you can grow your reserves really fast, you could also tank them. And before I tell you the name of these types of policies or features, I need to point something out. There are terminology differences around the world that can cause some confusion with these labels, but I'm going to break it down as best as I can, just so that you get the general idea of the overall framework. A variable life insurance policy is one where you can select how the reserves are invested. That means instead of relying on an insurance company's more conservative investments, you could pick investment funds that have more potential return, but also more risk. A universal life insurance policy refers to a policy that has a number of parts that you can tinker with. You can adjust your death benefit up or down over time. You can also adjust your premiums up or down. And in theory, you can design it to look like any other type of life insurance policy. So this ability to tinker with it and the different moving parts makes it universal in application, potentially. Now, in some countries, like Canada, for example, when people refer to universal life insurance policies, they mostly associate it with the ability to pick the investments for the reserves. In the United States, this is not the same. You can find four main types of universal life insurance policies. Guaranteed universal life, universal life, indexed universal life, and variable universal life. Sounds like a lot, but trust me, you actually now have all the knowledge you need to understand all of this more easily. The main differences between these four types of universal life policies are in how the reserves are handled. With guaranteed universal life or guaranteed UL policies, they are not designed to build cash values and so the premiums are a bit lower. Regular universal life puts the reserves into conservative interest-bearing investments. Indexed universal life puts the reserves into a type of investment that is exposed to stock market indexes, but with guardrails. Your upside is capped and your downside exposure is also limited. So there's some trade-offs to that. And then a variable universal life policy allows you to pick from different mutual funds to invest in with a wide range of risk and return profiles. So you can shoot the lights out or you could also potentially blow yourself up. So again, while we can build a basic framework for how life insurance works in general, you always have to be mindful of jurisdictional differences. Let's end with a quick recap because we've covered a lot of ground. There are two different main types of life insurance, temporary and permanent. Term life is temporary insurance. It's relatively cheap when you're young and quite unaffordable in old age. Permanent insurance is designed to be just that, permanent. In order to achieve that, you pay more upfront. These early excesses are put into cash values or reserves that grow over time to cover the death benefit later in life and keep premiums more manageable as well. Whole life is a type of permanent insurance that fits this bill. With participating whole life, you get to participate in the profits of the insurance company who may give you dividends or bonuses every year if the reserves grow faster than they predicted, which is usually every year. And with non-participating whole life, you do not participate in the insurance company's profits, but your initial premiums start out lower. If you want more control over how the reserves are invested, you have the ability to pick the investments with certain policies. In the United States and other countries, they are called variable life insurance policies. If you also want more control of other variables in your policy, like changing your death benefit amount over time or the premiums that you pay in a given year, you would look at a universal life policy. In some countries, like the United States, you can buy universal life policies with a wide range of options for how the reserves are invested, from no control to complete control, like a variable universal life policy. And again, in some other countries, it can be common that universal life is used mostly in reference to the ability to invest the reserves as you want. So just be mindful to do some digging about the specifics where you live. In the next video, I'm going to provide you with a framework for figuring out how much of a death benefit you might need and what type of policy makes the most sense. So we're going to apply what we learned here, but you're going to see it's going to be super simple after having watched this video. You've probably come a long way in the last, I don't know how long this video is going to end up being, 10, 15 minutes. Um, 
But if you made it to the end of this video, hit the like button if you haven't already. And I hope you'll subscribe to my channel as well. Thanks so much for watching. Yeah, I make decisions to glow. Ridiculous flow, potential to glow. You know, I, I just do that. Consolidate my readers, line it up, put them together. Anyone that ever let me down, forget them forever. My memory's bad. Remember me, though? My memory's gone. My memory, it limits me, home. No tree huggers, cause all the lumber's gone.